Welcome to the Douglas World War II Flying Training Museum. My name is Tim Oliver. I'm a docent at the museum, which means I give tours and I give the interpreter history and tell the stories of the people who flew and actually worked here at Douglas uh, during its three years of operation. Uh, it did run from October 1941. The first class arrived with 67 aviation cadets. They graduated the week after Pearl Harbor. Uh, the program ran for three years. At the uh, end of December 1944, the Army Air Force realized that they had enough capacity to train new pilots and they didn't need civilian pilots to train these pilots in their primary training, which occurred here at Douglas, as well as the other 54 primary training sites. So what we have here is a barracks display. This building was one of the original 11 barracks. Six of those still remain here at Douglas. As a matter of fact, 12 of the original 22 structures remain at Douglas, making us one of the most intact flight training facilities of its kind from World War II. Uh, so over here we have a couple of cadets. They're standing morning inspection by their bunks. Uh, their tactical officer in the pith helmet, he would have been a, either a lieutenant non-pilot or a senior cadet, only in charge of their military ground training, not having anything to do with their flight training. They're dressed out in their khaki daytime uh, classroom uniform. They had different uniforms when they went over to the flight line. The two bunk beds here, the frames are original to this base. They've been uh, fixed up to look like they were back in the day. Uh, the two desks as well, and one of the typewriters that came out of the admin building. Uh, the rest of these things, radios uh, and uh, other uh, desk items uh, are from the period they just weren't from here at Douglas. And oh, by the way, cadets had to bring their own radio or their own typewriter if they wanted to use it in their barracks. These were not provided by the uh, Air Force. Down in the end here is a photo of Mr. Raymond and Mr. Mr. Richardson. They were the owners of the Raymond and Richardson Aviation Company that did civilian pilot schools prior to Douglas becoming an Air Force base. Uh, they started here in 1939. They were teaching college students from down the road at uh, South Georgia State College how to fly. And in 1941, May of 41, the Air Corps came here, contracted with Raymond and Richardson to build the entire campus, hire all the civilian personnel who work on campus, including all the instructor pilots. The only non-civilian uh, was the military check pilot. Uh, at some point, there were about 80 civilian pilots, 245 actually served here during that three-year period. Mr. Raymond on the left in the suit, Mr. Richardson on the right. You'll notice that the instructors wore the same uniforms as the cadets. The only thing different would have been their uh, shoulder patch, their cap badge, and the wings they wore. Those were purely civilian. As a matter of fact, very few of those instructors had any military background before they came here. They had to be taught the Air Corps way of training. Okay, Most of the students who came here had never flown an airplane in their life. First time ever was here at Douglas. So uh, we do have a latrine display. It's the only one actually left in all the buildings remaining on base of what the latrines uh, used to look like. We've got pictures on the wall of uh, airplanes and cadets uh, that were here at Douglas. We do have this interesting photograph here this is a photograph of the instructor pilots taken in 1943 uh, in front of their aircraft lined up on the flight line. Uh, th their ages ran anything from 20 to about age 40, okay? So, and they came from various backgrounds. Most of them were stunt pilots, crop duster pilots, uh, instructor pilots at civilian schools, maybe a few airline pilots, and most of them went back to doing those jobs once their time here was ended at Douglas. Up on the wall here, we have an overhead photo taken in 1943, which shows the entire complex that was built. It took about a year, a company from Miami came in, contracted by Raymond and Richardson to build it. The reason these buildings have lasted so long is because that company built these using concrete floors, masonry walls, heavy beamed roofs, whereas at other locations, the Army Corps of Engineers put up wooden walls, tar paper roofs, they're only supposed to be temporary buildings. These buildings were built to last. Unfortunately, termites and weather took its toll over time, but again, 12 of the original 22 remain. Uh, and that's depicted in this uh, graph here. All the gray uh, structures are no longer exist. We have a barracks display, or a, uh, 
<laughs> closet display of all the typical, typical uniforms that were issued to the cadets, both summer and winter. These are actual uniform items that were issued during World War II, just not to anybody here necessarily. Uh, they wore brown shoes, they wore brown boots, uh, leather. Uh, these are all reproduction because it's hard to find good leather shoes from 1943. There was no air conditioning in any of the barracks. The only buildings that had air conditioning was the admin building, the mess hall, the um, classroom building, the infirmary, and the cadet canteen. All the barracks, they had a heater, oil-based heater, no air conditioning. They did issue fans for them in the summertime, get a little breeze going, and quite often the, the cadets would move their bunks onto the uh, screened-in porches in, at night in the summertime to get a little bit of comfort uh, to sleep in. The airplane flown here for primary training was the PT-17 Stearman, Type 75 they called it. Stearman was a company in Kansas that was bought out by the Boeing company, but they still used the name Stearman to identify these aircraft. These aircraft were also used by a lot of other allied countries for parts of their pilot training as well. The uh, Air Corps and the Navy bought over 10,000 of these aircraft to support all their primary training during World War II. It's open cockpit, has two wings, no radio, and no intercom. So the only way to communicate with the tower to get your takeoff and landing clearance is through the light gun system. It's an electric gun, light bulb, and it had three filters, green, red, and yellow. Green meant you were cleared to taxi, take off, or land. Red meant hold your position on the ground or do not land in the pattern. And then yellow meant use caution. They had to learn that here anyway, just to be able to fly in and out of Douglas, but it was also the backup method in case you lost your radio and other aircraft, because every other aircraft they flew in their training had a radio in it. Because the pattern can't be saturated with too many aircraft without radios, much of their training was done at four different auxiliary airfields that were located within 10 miles of Douglas. These were farmers fields leased by the government for about a dollar an acre a year from a local farmer. It was a sod grass field and they did most of their touch and go practice with their instructors and then above that they did all their most of their area work which included spins and stalls and shondells, loops, things like that uh, for advanced handling. The way the instructor taught the students was Typically, he flew in the front seat. The student would sit in the back seat. They wore parachutes. It was a seat pack variety because that was their cushion for their seat. And they had a helmet, but it didn't have a headset. What the instructor did was he would yell into what was called a Gosport tube. It's a funnel. The student had the earpieces in his helmet in the other cockpit, but it was one way only. So they always had to brief hand signals for maneuvers they were gonna do and who had control of the aircraft by shaking the stick, working the rudder pedals, that sort of thing. Very uh, basic way of doing it, and that's still the same way taught today in primary training. Very basic instrumentation. This airplane was not meant to fly in the weather, and the students were not allowed to fly at night. They got that training at another, uh, the next level of training. So they only flew in the daytime only when the weather was good, okay? They would, before they could even fly the aircraft, they were required to get about eight or 10 hours in the old Link Trainer. The Link Trainer was the first flight simulator, okay? Yeah. Made by Mr. Link in the early 30s, sold to the Air Force, the Navy, the civilian airlines as well. And it would include the instrumentation from the airplane at that particular location, okay? And here at Douglas and at the other primary training bases, they were not teaching these guys how to fly in the weather. They were only teaching them how to read instruments once they got airborne and make changes in heading altitude and airspeed. So the student would climb in there, he had a headset, the instructor sat at a console, he would operate the controls that would uh, modify the engine or put turbulence in. Uh, there was no navigation system, but he could also monitor what the student was reading on his instrument panel. And then he just recorded his uh, performance a, on a 30 minute session perhaps. Uh, enlisted men did this job, okay. They instructed through a headset, and then they would debrief the student on how well he performed. We had four of these devices here by the 1944. They were located in a building on the south end of campus that no longer exists. For the briefing, they would brief in the hangar, the mission they were gonna fly, all the maneuvers, 
They would walk to hangar number one to get their parachute, sign it out. Then they would go to the, the dispatch office. The dispatch office was located at the base of the control tower. And here we have a picture of the control tower with the dispatch office. The dispatcher would assign them the aircraft for their mission, tell them where it was parked, take their names down, call the names up to the tower so they knew who was flying the airplane at that time, and if they had any maintenance issues after they returned from flight, they would record that and let the uh, mechanics know in the hangars what they had to do to fix them. With the exception of a couple of male supervisors, the dispatchers were all women, as you can see in this photo here and uh, they took turns. There was only about three or four seats in the dispatch office, so they did shifts during the day only when the weather was good. Aircraft were fixed in the three hangars out there. All the, all the mechanics, save the military overseers, because the military oversaw each bit of operations, but they didn't do the, the, the legwork for the most part. They were supervisors. By the end of the program here in 1944, over half the mechanics working on those aircraft were women. And we have a photo of some of them right here. Oh, the one in the hat in particular, this is a guy and the rest of them are women, okay. This young lady here, Emily Jo Ireland, became nationally famous as a civilian female aircraft mechanic here at Douglas. How that happened was her uncle worked for Raymond and Richardson. She was from Smyrna, Georgia, up near Atlanta. She was the valedictorian of her graduating class. She wanted to fly, but she couldn't get into a flying program, so her uncle said, come on down here and we'll sign you up as a mechanic. She agreed. So in 1942 through 1944, she worked as an aircraft mechanic and got her license here through Raymond and Richardson Aviation. She was very popular with the cadets. She was very good at her job also. In 1943, one of the cadets who was writing some articles for the base newspaper, wrote an article on Emily Jo being a civilian female aircraft mechanic. That article was picked up by the Atlanta Journal-Constitution newspaper and run statewide. The old Parade magazine, if you know what that was, saw the article and ran it nationwide. So people around the country learned about Emily Jo doing her part for World War II here at Little Old Douglas. A year ago, She's passed away now in 2008, but a year ago her son came to the museum with a box full of her memorabilia from her time here at Douglas in high school and then what she did after she left Douglas. And our curator scanned a lot of that stuff and put it in this binder here so people can learn the whole story about Emily Jo and her contribution to the effort here. Uh, her time in high school, while she was here, and then we even have a picture of Emily Jo later in life when she was retired working up in uh, Atlanta. Our gate guards were not military police. They were all civilian hires by Raymond and Richardson. About a year ago, a gentleman came in. His father had been a gate guard here. He had his revolver that he wore when he was at the front gate working his shifts. Uh, 32 caliber revolver and eventually we're going to put it on display as soon as we can get a secure way of doing that. About three months ago, uh, a young man who works with the uh, Georgia State Patrol down the road came in and told about his grandfather who worked as a gate guard. We didn't know about him, so we're going to get some more information on him and add that to our repertoire of stories of the people who worked here. Uh, we have display items here uh, donated to the museum by either people who worked here or family members. These are all things that were used by those folks here at Douglas. So to wrap it all up, about, we estimate about nine to 10,000 aviation cadets arrived here during that three year period. We don't have complete records, unfortunately, but we know about a lot of them, at least 5,000 we know about. We estimate about 6,000 graduated the course and went on to the next level of training to another base. Okay, so it was about a one-third uh, attrition rate. The bulk of those guys, well, a lot of them were washed out for medical reasons, physical reasons, injuries, fear of flying. Don't think flying's really for me. I'd rather do something else. Well, those guys are going to go into the infantry with the Army because they belong to the Army. But the, a lot of the washouts who were still qualified to fly, just not going to be the pilot, went to be bombardiers or navigators on the heavy aircraft. 
and some of them even met up with some of the guys they went through training here later on. So to graduate from this course, which was a nine week course, you, on your check ride, you had to demonstrate to the check pilot that you could safely and correctly start the engine, follow the instructions from the tower using the light gun signals, do safe and proper pattern work, touch and go landings, and safe and proper area work to the minimum standards. If you could do that, they'd sign you off, and now you're off to basic training school at another base. So that's pretty much what took place here at Douglas on these aviation cadets flying the PT-17 Stearmans.